And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly estate of his maidservant, and he has done great things to me. And behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So you might have noted that the gospel text for this day is the same as it was uh, just a little over a month ago for the Feast of the Visitation. That's when, well, the first part of what we heard today where Mary goes and visits Elizabeth, uh, her cousin, Elizabeth, who has also conceived, not by the Holy Spirit, of course, but by, um, but by God through a miraculous conception, naturally, but yet miraculous to old, barren, of the priestly class, Elizabeth and Zechariah. Mary comes, of course, having also conceived miraculously, but this by the Holy Spirit. And when she came, of course, the babe in Elizabeth's womb leaped for joy. So we heard about that a little over a month ago on the visitation. But that word visitation, of course, draw my, drew my attention uh, to this past Sunday's gospel text, which I didn't have the privilege of preaching. Somehow I managed to always go on vacation when Jesus foretells the destruction of Jerusalem. I wonder why that is. Hmm. It wasn't a vacation this time, but I happen to be out of town. So you, you heard on Sunday, when Jesus drew near this and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon you because you did not know the time of your visitation. So Jesus speaks of Jerusalem, not metaphorically, actually, quite literally. All those false teachers, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, those who were, had, this, had the letter of the law but not the Spirit of God, who did not give the people peace and the forgiveness of sins, and proclaim peace through obedience to the law, which is not what God ever promised. And so they did not know the time of their visitation, and just, well, about four decades later, Rome would level Jerusalem, not one stone upon another, all because they did not repent and believe the gospel. They had put their trust and their hope in, well, their law, including the law of God, in their city, in their birthright, and not in God's giving. And so when Jesus came and visited them and called them, like John the Baptist before him, to repentance, they refused and instead conspired to have him executed by crucifixion. Of course, this was according to the foreknowledge and will of God that Jesus would be killed at the hands of sinful men to redeem sinful men to deliver the forgiveness of sins to you and to me. And thanks be to God that Jesus comes and continues to visit us and to dwell with us and that we know the day of his visitation. That's when, well, he delivers his word and sacrament to us. And so you're here this evening for that very purpose. And in that way, Mary actually is a model example of the church. You've probably heard her um, considered like the icon of the church or the example. Sometimes you'll see this in art. Even on the day of Pentecost, uh, the artists take liberty and they have the, the 12 apostles, well, 11, I should say. Uh, but there is a 12th there. And at the center, they put Mary because, of course, she is the mother of the church, they say, which uh, is not really what the scriptures teach. Of course, it's Christ who is the one who is the foundation of the church, the cornerstone and it's the Spirit who calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ. And so there's abuse when it comes to Mary, but there is also a commendable reason for us to remember us, remember her this evening, the way that when the angel Gabriel came to her, as we sang, and pronounced to her that she would conceive a son by the Holy Spirit, and that son would be Emmanuel, God with us, the son of David, long promised, the Messiah, the King, that she said, as we sang in the hymn, well, first she bowed her head, 
and said, to, be, to me be as it pleaseth God, she said. My soul shall laud and magnify God's holy name, most highly favored lady, Gloria. You'll note that in her Magnificat, that song that we heard again today, that she doesn't take credit. That's another reason why she's a great example for us as Christians, as a Christian church, is at the conclusion of whatever great works God accomplishes for us, whether it, it be gathering a Christian church in this place, uh, maintaining and sustaining a Christian day school, supporting missions both here and abroad, and completing acts of mercy and compassion for our neighbors, that at the end of whatever God chooses to accomplish in us by his word, that we too, like Mary would say, be it as you have said. Right? And even then, uh, maybe in the way of the famous composer, Johann Sebastian Bach, say, glory to God and him alone, right? Or thanks be to God. Recognizing that whatever good comes from us is not from us, but actually worked in us by God and his word through the forgiveness of sins and through the Holy Spirit. And thus it was for Mary too. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, not because I am worthy of this esteem to be the mother of, of our Lord, or as our confession state, the Theotokos, the mother of God. No, it's not through worth. It's not through some kind of immaculate conception, as some falsely teach. But rather, she is to be regarded because of what God had given her. This lowly maidservant was called blessed, not by her doing, not by her work, but rather by God's work. The one who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Or, as we might say, thanks be to God, or to God alone be the glory. But she is quick also to remind us that whatever gifts that God bestows upon us are not for us alone. When the Lord visits us with his redemption to forgive us our sins, to deliver us again into his kingdom over and over, it is not for us alone, but it is for all nations. And so his mercy, the mercy that was implanted into Mary's womb, is a mercy that went forth, clothed with the garments of salvation and covered with the robes of righteousness. Jesus. Not just for all nations, but for every generation, from generation to generation. It is in Jesus that she, well, in a way, is the last prophet foretelling of or at least speaking prophetically, telling of things to come. When Jesus himself will defeat the powers of sin, death, and hell, deliver us into his kingdom, and there bestow upon us his gifts, his royal inheritance, we who are sons in him, to be filled with good things, to be helped as, the servant, as his servant Israel. And Mary rightly recognizes again that this is not just it's not because of her, although it's been given to her. She has a special vocation, uniquely given. And it is, thus it's for all nations. And not only that, it's from generation to generation. So it Jesus comes to redeem the prophets of old who looked forward to him and also all those who have yet to come, even yet to be born in our time and times to come. But he did this not because we asked, but because he promised. And again, this is to be commended to us, that we, that we always give God credit, but we always recognize, too, that, well, it's quite foreign to us. It's not what we would have expected. The natural religion of our heart is that, well, we would have to earn God's favor, that we would have to uh, worship him. Or even if we don't have to earn his favor, he gives us his favor, then we have to work to keep it. So that is on us. But no, Mary rightly recognizes that this mercy was given to her because of the promise. And what good news that is. Not by law, but by way of promise, gospel, good news. And so we are redeemed by the son of Mary's womb. A woman who was born under the law, as Paul said, but to redeem us who are under the curse of the law, to free us in the forgiveness of sins from that law, to live as, well, sons of God, heirs of heaven, 
And in that way, maybe the artist got it wrong with putting Mary at the middle, but Mary was certainly there on Pentecost. But not only that, because you are in Jesus, well, there you are too in that painting, gathered with saints and with apostles and with prophets and with evangelists and with Mary and the other women and with all those who have trusted in Jesus for their salvation. And maybe on the last day we too will sing like she did, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. He has done mighty, the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen. We stand to confess. Confess. 